Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. So today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Theo Zanis, who's the head of the Neural and Data Science Lab and an associate professor at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and the Zucker School of Medicine, Hofstra Northwell. His thesis, supervised by Dr. Vasilis Mamarilis, focused on developing machine learning and system identification approaches for multi-input, multi-output hippocampal neural circuits to be used for a cognitive neuroprocesses platform. Now you are working on this field called bioelectronic medicine. So this this whole bioelectric medicine is, is something new and it, it, it's very hazy. So A, I think it'll be really nice if you kind of explain what bioelectric bioelectronic medicine is and why is it vouched to be the breakthrough innovation in medicine? Sure. So um, the field or the name bioelectronic medicine is is relatively new. It's been around for, I guess, a bit more than 10 years or, or something like that, 10 to 15 years. Um, but the fundamental premise of the field is, is not, right? And the fundamental premise of the field is that uh, we want to use electricity and take advantage of the electrical nature of a lot of different processes in our bodies to try to diagnose and treat all kinds of different diseases and conditions. Um, and the idea of using electricity to try to treat symptoms or, or conditions is not a new one. It's been around for thousands of years. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, I guess the formulation of bioelectronic medicine you know, the, the, the actual uh, term bioelectronic medicine was started and gained traction in the last 10 years. Um, but it involves or it overlaps quite a bit with the neuromodulation field, uh, which is the idea of modulating the function of uh, the nervous system uh, through devices, through other different ways. Um, so, but, but but I guess uh, some common understanding of bioelectronic medicine is that it's mainly focused on the peripheral nervous system rather than the central nervous system. So, so uh, the central nervous system being the brain and the spinal cord, uh, uh, all the devices that interface with them are more, uh, I guess, could be categorized as neuromodulation devices, uh, whereas uh, bioelectronic medicine kind of mainly focused as a term on peripheral uh, devices, right? In the nerves, right? In our, in our, uh, uh, in the nerves of our bodies. Um, but that's not a strict definition, meaning that, you know, these are in flux, what we call bioelectronic medicine approaches that even uh, uh, interact with the brain. And the reason for that is that, you know, it's the, 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 the CNS and PNS, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system uh, dichotomy is, you know, when it comes to inter interacting with these systems, it's a bit arbitrary because you know when you interact with the brain, you most probably interact, you most probably affect functions of the peripheral nervous system, and vice versa. When you interact with peripheral nerve, peripheral nerves, you affect the function of the brain. So, you know, that's why I guess it's a hazy, let's say, field because um, it's you know it, it encompasses a lot of different things that have to do with uh, using electricity interfacing with the nervous system to try to uh, uh, diagnose and treat diseases. We, we've got trillions of cells in, in a body. They run because of electricity. Or, or, or human brain with 80 billion uh, neurons, uh, 100 trillion synapses, it works through wiring, firing uh, through electricity. Now, th th there's uh, Michael Levin also from Tuft University who's working on something called as bioelectricity and using it for regenerative medicine. How, how, how is that different from bioelectronic uh, medicine? Well, I guess uh, it's not necessarily different. Again, uh, the, uh, the idea of, of using electricity to uh, alter functions of the nervous system uh, is not fundamentally different than using electricity to promote uh, uh, neuronal growth or to promote uh, changes in, in uh, uh, plasticity or, or synaptic changes, right? So I'm not sure it's, it's, it's entirely different. Uh, uh, I guess the idea is that the, 
uh, you know, you might have like different applications in the same way that there are bioelectronic medicine projects or, or research programs that are focusing on reading the uh, activity of the brain, of the, of the nerves, right? Uh, to try to diagnose diseases or diagnose disease severity and trying to alter the function of these nerves by stimulating them with electricity, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the effort there is to try to uh, 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 cure or help with disease symptoms. So these are, I guess, two different things, but they're all under the umbrella of bioelectronic medicine. So I would say that, you know, if you're using electricity to try to promote uh, neuronal growth or or try to promote, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, changing in in, uh, in synaptic plasticity, that could also be uh, bioelectronic medicine. So again, again, the terms are, uh, are, are a bit hazy and, and frankly I'm not even sure they necessarily matter that much it's it's, it's umbrella terms that uh, that we use just kind of like to briefly uh, uh, describe what we're doing but really when it comes down to the details of what you're doing that's that's really what's important right so the details of, of what you're doing uh, doctor could, could could you elaborate on that and, and through these details what are the applications that are arising which is going to redefine healthcare Sure. So um, I guess that we, we work on, on, on various different uh, uh, programs but, and, and, and projects, but uh, specifically for bioelectronic medicine, um, we kind of have two main thrusts. So the, the, the first one, which we've been working since I joined uh, Feinstein, has been to try to record the activity of, the, of, of various peripheral nerves and more specifically, the vagus nerve, um, and try to decode information out of it, right? So to read those those uh, uh, the activity that flows through the nerve, and try to decode information as it relates to specific diseases or conditions. So one of the things that we published back in two thousand eighteen um, was a study that looked at whether uh, the vagus nerve was encoding presence of cytokines, which are inflammatory mediators, uh, and uh, the language of that encoding, right? And our project was essentially to record from the nerve of uh, a mouse. We, we, we did these studies in mice and, and uh, uh, expose that animal to uh, two uh, very well-known uh, cytokines, TNF-alpha and, uh, and IL-1-beta. So, um, when we expose the, the, the mouse to, to these cytokines, the activity of the vagus nerve changes. So we record those changes, and then we use machine learning to actually decode those changes as, as if we don't know what's going on uh, with the animal. And what we've shown is that we can use these signals to, to identify whether the animal was exposed to TNF or IL-1 beta, or it, what, there was no exposure, right, with a certain amount of uh, uh, accuracy. And uh, that was, I guess, the first time that somebody has tried to do that. And it has implications because you can think of, you know, reading from nerves that sense these changes naturally in our bodies, right? So they sense the emergence of inflammation uh, early on before symptoms arise could be beneficial because we could build devices that... Uh, potentially can detect, uh, again, uh, an inflammation coming way before symptoms arise. And that's important because it's not only diagnostic, but also it could be used to uh, better inform neurostimulation uh, uh, approaches. The idea there being that right now, most of the uh, devices that uh, stimulate the vagus nerve, they do it in an open uh, loop uh, manner, meaning that you, the doctor sets some specific uh, parameters and the, the patient goes home and the device works on these parameters and these parameters don't change. But uh, the idea of recording from the nerve and reacting to those changes might provide a better strategy to stimulate that nerve because you stimulate it when you need to rather than constantly. And uh, you stimulate it for as much time as you need to, right? Um, and, and we think these are 
the next generation of these devices, right? Right now we have a, a lot of different patients that are implanted with these devices and they work with this manner. And we think the next generation would be a smarter device that reacts to the state of the organism rather than keep doing what it what it's doing. This vagus nerve, you know, I mean, you know, how much how much do we actually know about it? Because I mean, you, you, the NIH granted some six point seven million grant, and, and you and Stavros Zanis were working on understanding the anatomical connectivity of the the vagus nerve. So, how much do we currently understand the vagus nerve? And if 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 we are able to understand the vagus nerve, what are the healthcare? Uh, devices that you talk about or diagnostics or therapy or what, what are the things that we can do to redefine healthcare? So that's a great question. The, the, the our current understanding of the vagus nerve um, is uh, extensive, but by no means uh, complete. And uh, um, I mean, you know, you could, you could give the parallel of the brain. We know a lot of things about the brain, but the brain is so complicated that we, we've barely scratched the surface of what we understand about the, how the brain works and like the intricate details of that, right? The, a similar fact uh, remains for the vagus nerve as well. Uh, we, the vagus nerve is uh, uh, the largest nerve of our body. It, it, it innervates most of our peripheral organs and it's extremely complicated uh, because it connects the brain to all these peripheral organs and it has fibers or connections that uh, go uh, towards the organs, right? So he has uh, uh, fibers, nerve fibers that end up in the organs, right? Uh, so that enables the brain to control the function of these organs. But it also contains fibers that start from the organs and then end up in the brain. And so these are the afferent uh, uh, nerves that essentially monitor the function of the of the uh, organs and report back to the brain. So you have this bidirectional activity that's happening in the in the nerve. So we we know that, but we don't know the exact details of that activity. And also, what's more important is we are st still trying to understand how the nerve connects to all these different organs. And 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 the reason for that is that the the nerve, although it's one nerve, it's highly complicated because it has a hundred thousand in the human it has around a hundred thousand fibers 80 percent of these uh, uh, are believed to be uh, sensory meaning that they sense uh, uh, the status of the peripheral organs and report back to the brain and 20 percent uh, motor meaning that they take information from the brain send it back to the organs but that organization of these fibers is not random in the in the nerve it's not like you have like a hundred thousand fibers and they just they're a mess, right? Like they're uh, they're just like randomly uh, located. The nerve, as it goes down from the brain through the neck and down to the body, it branches off continuously. So it branches off uh, to the larynx. It branches off to the heart. It branches off to the to the lungs. It branches off to the uh, to our guts. So those branches are. Uh, you know, essentially guide the fibers that are dedicated to each of these organs to these organs and back, right? So um, uh, what we don't yet know and what the work that we're doing through this NIH grant is trying to uh, elucidate is how these fibers are organized inside the nerve. And the reason why this is important is when we interact with a nerve, we want to be uh, very precise. So when, let's say, we stimulate the nerve to treat a cardiac disease or a pulmonary disease or inflammatory disease, ideally, we would like to stimulate only those fibers that go to the organ that we want to control. So if we want to control the heart, we should target the cardiac fibers. If we want to control inflammation, we should target the, the fibers that end up in the spleen, right? And when usually these devices are implanted at the, at the level of the neck, which is high up. And the problem there is that all these fibers are now together, right? All these are, are uh, part of like the same nerve. So when you stimulate the whole nerve at that level, you're pretty much stimulating everything, right? And, and so, so the idea of, creating more selective, more targeted uh, stimulation 
can only arise from our understanding of what the anatomical organization of these fibers are, are at the level where we implant. And that can guide electrode manufacturing so we can make better electrodes to target specific fibers. It can guide parameter selection of the stimulation uh, uh, devices so that, again, we try to target what to, uh, the, the fibers that we need to. Um, and the, 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 again, the, the goal is to become more specific so that you're more efficacious in your stimulation and also you reduce the side effects. So when you want to stimulate on the, only the heart, you don't want to affect somebody's the, 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 uh, the function of the other organs, right? So that's, that's the idea of, uh, of why we want to understand the anatomical organization. It, it, it will provide very useful information for the whole uh, field and the whole community so that they can build better devices that are more targeted. But the, the human body is is not, not just complex. I, I think it's so beautiful. And, and I think, you know, when you understand the entire process from the nerves to the white fibers and to target and stimulate exactly the space that you want to, you know, you get into the precision medicine, you, you get into a world where we then will be able to look at a specific condition and, and we'll be able to specific and address it in a way that we are not bombarding the body with other problems. How beautiful, how mind-blowing. Now, you, you also have worked on a non-invasive bioelectronic device for vagus nerve stimulation in partnership with the TIVIC health uh, system. W would you like to talk about that and other uh, maybe products that could come out of this research that you're talking about? Sure. So um, the, the partnership with TIVIC just started. Uh, so we we haven't gotten any result yet. We're, we're currently enrolling uh, subjects for that study. Uh, but in general, the idea of uh, uh, non-invasively targeting the vagus nerve has been also around for some years now. Uh, and that stems from the fact that right now, the only devices that we know um, are FDA approved uh, for specific conditions are the ones that are uh, implanted, right? So they require surgery and you uh, open up uh, a, a, a window to the vagus nerve on the neck, right? So that, that requires surgery. And of course, that's a barrier that is not easy to overcome for a lot of other diseases or in general for the general public. Like not everyone wants to get that surgery, although it's not a very complicated surgery. It's definitely not brain surgery because you don't need to go through the skull and all that. It's a lot easier. It's actually an outpatient surgery, but still it's a surgery and a lot for, that's a barrier for a lot of people. So there has been uh, attempts to try to stimulate the nerve non-invasively. And there are attempts through the neck where you place electrodes on the neck and you try to, to force uh, stimulation uh, and electricity through the neck. There is also the auricular uh, vagus nerve stimulation approach where uh, we know that there are branches, the auricular branch of the, of the nerve that goes, all, all, uh, goes up to the ear and specifically at a couple of different points in the auricle. And uh, you can stimulate those branches again, using specific devices that are fitted to your ear or like electrodes that, that target these locations. So there has been some work and we've done some work before on this um, uh, non-invasive approach. Um, it's still not an approach that has been proven to work. We currently have a, an NIH CDC grant that tests this approach for PTSD patients. And we want to see whether that works, but we're not sure whether that works. That's kind of like right now we're waiting to see based on our trial, based on this pilot study, whether this actually is efficacious. Um, but the work with TIVIC will focus on, again, uh, uh, evaluating how uh, the, their approach of stimulating non-invasively the nerve uh, would work. Um, and uh, that, that, Again, if, if we can manage to stimulate uh, uh, the nerve non-invasively, that opens up a lot of different uh, possibilities because if you don't need to go through the surgery for a certain amount of people, then uh, uh, you, know, you might be opening up this, this uh, therapy for, uh, for a lot more people, right? Um, 
but again, that 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 still is on the testing stages. We're not, you know, this is not a device that's FDA approved that is, uh, um, you know, uh, approved for a specific condition. Uh, we're still in the exploratory phase of that technology. When when you're talking about healthcare, we 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 producing humongous amount of data. You know, we we you know, and any part of the data, whether it's the brain or the entire part of the body. And now there's this role of AI, machine learning, because the data is being collected, and and the through data you're inferring some useful information, and then you're creating useful applications. Uh, you are vested in machine learning and AI. What is this role of AI and machine learning in AI uh, healthcare now? A better future, a better future. Sure. So that's a, that's I guess the, the the other part of our lab and our work, right? And it's it's something that came up uh, in the past uh, five to six years, and um, in in a sense, it's it's similar to what we try to do for the, what we've used to do for the brain, what we try to do with the nerves, but. Now we're we're targeting and we're trying to use data that are more commonly available uh, from from all our patients. So one thing I should say is that our lab is part of the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research, which is the research arm of Northwell Health. And Northwell Health is New York's largest health system. It has 23 large hospitals. It has more than 700 outpatient clinics. We serve millions of New Yorkers uh, every single year. Uh, so you can imagine the amount of data that are collected every year from all these hospital visits or outpatient clinic visits. And um, the idea of, applic- of applying uh, machine learning and AI in healthcare is essentially to try to, uh, to assist our uh, healthcare professionals, whether these are doctors, nurses, or even administrative personnel to do their job easier and uh, to do their job better and faster and more efficient. And at the end of the day, that transfers to benefits for the patient, right? Because if the doctor has technological tools that enable them to make more precise diagnosis or do better treatment decisions uh, uh, or uh, attend to them when they need, that means better outcomes, better experience for our patients in our hospitals. So this has been a, a, a field that has been growing tremendously the past years, parallel to the growth of new and better AI algorithms. Uh, so as the AI and, and, and machine learning field grows, the applications of the new methodologies that come out of that field also grow in the healthcare domain, right? So when the first convolutional neural networks started coming up, uh, you know, through uh, AlexNet or through other, you know, major advances in computer vision through deep uh, learning, the the opportunities of using these technologies on medical data, on medical images, all of a sudden became very apparent that a lot of people started working on them. Uh, so now you have AI tools and method and, and algorithms that perform as well or sometimes even better than professionals, than radiologists. Now, that doesn't mean that these technologies are going to replace these uh, doctors. That, that won't happen anytime in the future, anytime in the near future. But what, what I, I keep saying to our collaborators, our, our clinician collaborators and, in general, and the medical students, is that the, the AI won't replace doctors, but the doctors that use AI will replace the doctors that don't use AI. Not just the field of healthcare, but I think all industries fear the automation. You know, they say that you know AI is going to completely take over. And, and I think currently AI is in such a narrow space, though I mean in the next couple of decades, possibly it could go towards a you know maybe general intelligence. But yes, I, I think rather than fearing, I think we need to adopt it, leverage it, and create tools and applications that can you know, create a better future for humanity. Now, you you spoke about, you know, AI, ML being used, uh, a radiologist using it for image scanning and things like that. Could could, could you elaborate on that and maybe be a little bit more specific on the current, I mean, what's happening right now in in the field of AI and ML, which is becoming customer ready? Yeah. So, well, 
I'm, I don't think I can do justice to all the things that are happening right now in the field because it's, as I said, a very growing field. Every single day we see new uh, uh, findings, new papers that, that come out that are very, very impressive. I can kind of tell you some of the things that we're doing as it relates to the to the to the field in general. So so as I said, the field um, uses all kinds of different machine learning algorithms to and and to train them on medical data and and try to solve problems or bottlenecks uh, that we commonly have in uh, our hospitals all over the world. So one of the things that we've focused on, for instance is a deterioration, in-hospital deterioration. So we know that you know, a certain amount of, uh, uh, of patients that are admitted in hospitals all over the world actually deteriorate while being in the hospital. So they come in, they're not sick enough to go to the intensive care unit. So they are admitted in a regular uh, medical floor or a surgical floor. And then sometime later, they actually have a, what we call a hard clinical outcome, mean, meaning that they have an event that requires escalation of care. So all of a sudden they need to be rushed to the ICU or they might uh, experience uh, a, an event that requires a rapid response team to come in there, maybe do some very acute uh, 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 operations on the, on the patient, right? Maybe they, they uh, have a cardiac arrest or you know, sometimes, unfortunately, some people just die on the floor, right? So all these things are events that we call sudden deteriorations. But medically, a deterioration is never sudden. is a is a, a a result of things that are happening progressively, but we might not necessarily notice in the patient unless we really keep a close eye on that patient, right? And of course, in hospitals. In many hospitals all around the world, it's almost impossible to have like, you know, two, one doctor and one nurse constantly over a patient and checking up how well they're doing. So inevitably, we might have some patients that deteriorate and we're not noticing until the, the point that they it's, it might be late or it might be too late, right? So our idea is, why don't we try to do two things? So the first thing is to try to identify the patients that are stable and they are predicted to be stable and they won't have any chance of deteriorating. In those patients, we can keep doing what we're doing or even do less, right? So right now we check up on our patients every three to four hours. A lot of the times we do that overnight as well, which results in us going into the room and waking that patient up and disrupting their sleep, which is not a good thing, right? They don't like it. The nurses don't like it. So one of the things that we did was to create an algorithm to try to tell the nurses or the doctors or whoever would go into that room to wake up the patient and take vitals. You don't need to do that. That patient is stable. Let them sleep, right? Um, and that can make a big difference in the experience of the patient in the hospital and also in the recovery time, right? I mean, you know, if a good night's sleep goes a long way in you getting better in whatever you have. So that's one thing. But uh, at the same time, when we, once we do that, we save time from our doctors and our nurses to try to focus on the more ill, more acutely ill patients that require more attention, right? So take that attention from the patients that don't necessarily need that much attention and move it to the ones that really do. Uh, and, and there, what we're looking into work, doing is creating algorithms that will use continuously monitored Vitals. So there are these devices, kind of like a, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, but clinical. So these are clinically monitored patches. Usually they stick on the chest or somewhere else in, uh, on the patient. And they continuously monitor heart rate. They continuously monitor breathing rate, temperature in a lot of ways. Um, and, and you can use these continuously monitored vitals to, de to detect subtle trends or subtle changes in these vitals that can be very predictive of, of, an, of an event that's going to happen later on, right? And if you use AI and machine learning, you can actually predict that event in advance, alert the doctor or the nurse so that they pay more attention to the patient or maybe try to intervene and try to uh, stop that outcome from happening. So that's one of the, the, that's one of the projects that we're working on. Um, 
I guess the other uh, project that uh, that uh, we're working on is looking at again radiographs and trying to uh, use radiographs in conjunction with electronic health records and and kind of like take this multimodal approach where you're not just taking vitals or lab values but you're also taking images and and you're trying to predict in a more holistic way the progression and and you know try to predict how well this patient will fare during the hospitalization so and i think that's where the promise of this technology is is taking as much as uh, information as possible and as available from a specific patient and analyzing them in a way that it would be very hard for like a single human to analyze but these algorithms can when they are trained properly and uh, try to help the doctors and the nurses to make better decisions while they're treating these patients. Brain computer interface, you know, Elon Musk has made this this field extremely mainstream. Everybody knows about mainstream. Everybody is talking about brain computer interface and neural link. Now you've been part of the Montreal Neurological Institute and you've been recording brain data from primates. How do you think brain computer interface is going to uh, you know, shape the future of everything? So, Again, BCIs or brain computer interfaces have been around for a lot longer than Neuralink or, uh, uh, you know, um, it's a great thing that Elon Musk took an interest in, in the field, I think. Uh, and and Neuralink um, is take is making big strides that, that really help the field. Um, but it has been around for a lot longer. It just became mainstream, as you said. Uh, because of uh, uh, Neuralink and Elon Musk. Um, so brain-computer interfaces are an exciting technology, uh, mainly because they require a lot of different innovations for from a lot of different fields. So it's not only neuroscience that they, they require. There's, a, there's huge engineering uh, uh, challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, and, and various fields of engineering, right? So it starts from uh, uh, materials engineering to try to create uh, uh, the right electrodes. Uh, it, uh, uh, you know, how you're going to implant these electrodes or surgical techniques on how you would implant these electrodes in the brain. Um, then, uh, you know, when you read uh, from these electrodes the activity of the brain, how do you decode it? So there's a lot of machine learning and AI that could be applied there. Um, and then in general, the engineering of like creating one system that tries to do all these uh, at the same time, right? So it's, it's, it's very challenging. And I think one of the, the, the things that's very appealing to a lot of the scientists and, and me included when I started working on, on these in hippocampal prosthesis back at, uh, uh, at USC uh, in 2004 uh, was that it's a really, really hard problem, but it's extremely interesting. And also it can have like tremendous implications for uh, how we treat certain uh, conditions or diseases. Uh, because the idea, at least in the beginning of brain-computer interface, brain-computer interface is focused on, on the motor system. And they try to, and most of the applications of them that have been shown lately um, are relating to people that are quadriplegic, that are paraplegic, that, uh, that have some uh, uh, aspect of their, uh, you know, their ability to move being hampered because of like an accident or whatever. Um, and the idea there is that you can still record from the brain the, the, those signals, decode the intention to move, and then activate other, uh, 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 an intact limb if, if that's still there and, and stimulate the muscles and kind of bypass that, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, problem or uh, uh, activate the robotic arm if for, for the case of amputees, right? Um, but I think uh, brain-computer interfaces can extend a lot uh, to, to a lot of other applications, right? So as soon as we develop the right technologies and tools to read and write from the brain and, and circumvent uh, problematic regions, uh, you can have applications for speech decoding for people that are not able to to, to speak uh, for, for locked in patients, for instance, or uh, you can uh, 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 have applications for uh, blind people to try to, uh, you know, uh, have them see again 
uh, or applications. The, the initial application that I started working on this field was a, a, a cognitive neuroprosthesis uh, application where you're trying to, you're focusing on the hippocampus and you're trying to circumvent areas that uh, might uh, be damaged so they so you want a, you're not able to form new memories right so the idea is where can you circumvent that and uh enable these patients to to still form new memories so there are a lot of different applications that you could think of and it's still an it's been around for a while but because the problem is so immense it it still has not broken through to like the the all the the public right and, you know it's still in the in the um let's say in in you know in, in experiment in the experimental phase so there are many humans that have been implanted with with uh, some of these devices but they're th these are all part of clinical trials it's, there's no uh, uh right now uh, uh let's say device that's commonly available that you could go to your uh to your doctor and prescribe it for you so you mentioned about you know these brain computer interfaces which is giving you the ability to read and write of or data of the brain now a brain the three pound brain is the master tool for anything and everything you know if we are unable to unlock uh, what uh, i mean is held inside a brain I believe, I, I think we'll be able to completely redefine humanity and possibly uh, create, uh, augment the entire species also with, with, with its possibilities. Could, could you talk about that, maybe elaborate about that? Because you, you've you actually done some work in deep brain stimulation and you've also explored the use of electric stimulation to enhance memory for treating Alzheimer's. So, so maybe maybe, maybe it would be really cool if you could talk about those. Yeah, so um, I've done a bit of work on, on deep brain stimulation and, and I think that's, I'm not sure that that, really qualifies as a brain computer interface because uh, deep brain stimulation is a common uh, uh um let's say device and an operation that that's been used in park for parkinson pa patients for patients with a sensual tremor and it's been around for for many many decades now so it's not a, a brand new thing and most of the times it's just stimulating a very specific area of the brain and getting rid of the tremor. And it has been tremendously successful. There are videos all over YouTube that are extremely impressive, right, of that. Uh, so I'm not sure B uh, deep brain stimulation is, is part of BCI. I would say it's more part of neuromodulation and maybe even by electronic medicine than BCIs, right? But uh, as you said, BCI is one of the main appealing things of these technologies that it has implications, especially if these technologies become more and more uh, um, better and better, uh, and they can access more and more uh, areas of the brain, and they can read and also write from these areas. The possibilities are endless on, on how you could be using that to augment not only functions that are gone in patients, but, you know, in general, like, you know, uh, as you said, augment memory, augment uh, uh, cognitive processes. Um, that's a bit far off, but it's still good to dream. Uh, so so and it's always a good, uh, big and, and nice lofty goal. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that the, um, the premise of the cognitive neuroprosthesis that uh, I've worked on about 20 years ago uh, was that if you target a very specific area of the brain, which is the hippocampus, um, you could potentially in, and learn the uh, structure and the organization of that uh, area of the brain, then you can interfere with it, with its function. And the main idea there is that the hippocampus is, in, is involved in a lot of different things, but one of the things that it's involved uh, in is memory formation. Um, and the uh, the idea of, inter of of interacting, reading or writing from the hippocampus might uh, enable uh, creation or augmentation of memories uh, by using these these devices, right? Um, and again, that's not something that that has made it through to clinical applications, but it's a proof of concept that this could potentially be possible if we really in, uh, understand the structure of that specific uh, 
part of the brain and also interact with it by reading and writing on it in a brain to control the brain. Um, yeah, so so I mean, you know, if you take it too far, that's kind of like the promise of, you know, uh, movies like The Matrix, right? You know, if you want, you know, if you would have this technology and it would work perfectly, you know, you could potentially learn how to Kung Fu in like, you know, one second uh, if you upload that uh, memory or that skill uh, in the brain. But again, this is even now science fiction. It's not necessarily something that that we can do immediately. But we're building the blocks to, 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 to be able to do stuff that will help patients for now. And then if these building blocks and these technologies could uh, enable all these other abilities, then I, I guess that would be a good thing for the most part. You spoke about the movie Matrix. I, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of the movie Matrix. Uh, I've been invested in virtual reality since 2015. We, we've been developing these virtual worlds. And and, and from 2015 to now, what has happened is that we, we are able to like simulate these virtual worlds to make it completely photorealistic. So we've created these virtual worlds, which, which is completely photorealistic, which can fool a, 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 a user to think that the virtual is real and not just done that, we be doing that with the audio also and from stereo sound, we wanted to ambisonic spatial sound. So, so, so the, I, I think the promise of virtual reality is to simulate reality. Since you mentioned about matrix and that there are these guys such as Elon Musk, then there is Donald Hoffman who, who talks about space and time being a virtual reality headset and, and that we are living in a simulated world. Oh, what are your thoughts on something like that? I try not to think about it because uh, whenever we double into these uh, philosophical realms, uh, I often start getting headaches. Uh, so I, 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 as an engineer as and as a scientist, I try to you know keep my head to, uh, you know, firmly to the ground and and try to think of like you know actual real problems that we can uh, we can try to 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 solve um i would guess that everything anything uh, you know if you want to get very philosophical my my uh i guess view on this is that any everything is could be possible multiple universes could exist then parallel universes and uh you know we could be living uh in a simulation um that's you, I don't think you can uh, disprove that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not sure that thought process helps really with, with anything in real life. I mean, you know, it's a good uh, as a discussion over coffee or over wine, but uh, but really when it comes to, okay, but we're, you know, even if we are in this simulation, we still have things to work on um, because, you know, we want to help ourselves and, and other people. So, how you know what does this thought process help you in any way? I, I I don't see how. So I would I would much rather focus on things that I understand a bit better and and know how they work. Completely, completely uh, agree on that. So you you had uh, developed a non-invasive device for PTSD for the uh, first responders for the World Trade Centers. Is there any update on that? So we, uh, I, I got to correct you that we, we did not develop the device. We were, were creating parts of the device, but I mean, it's it's a stimulator. It's nothing, you know, very, very fancy. We've worked with, with a company in the beginning of the device that since is no longer. Uh, so we're kind of like carrying on with the study. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, we, we're, we're close to our target of 30 patients, uh, but we haven't reached that yet. And until we reach that, we cannot... Uh, uh, peek into the data uh, and the most important data of course is you know whether the, the patients because we split these patients into patients that receive the treatment and then some patients that receive a sham treatment so they don't really receive stimulation so that we can account for placebo and uh, we don't know yet we're blinded the patients are blinded everybody's blinded on who gets what so we don't we see some effects but we're not really sure what who do these belong to whether a specific patient is placebo or or the active treatment uh, so until we finish up the the uh, the recruitment and we do all the tests we won't know so 
Hopefully, we'll have some results to report uh, next year. But this year, we're trying to focus only on completing the, the trial and making sure that we recruit the, all our all the patients that we need to. Right. Doctor, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Really enjoyed talking to you. Your lab, Neural Data Science Lab. What's what's currently that you're working on? And it will be very cool if you could leave us with a picture, paint a picture of what the world would look like in the next 10 years with possibly bioelectronic medicine. First of all, the lab, uh, the Neural and Data Science Lab, we're a group of uh, uh, engineers, uh, medical doctors, uh, and uh, computer scientists uh, that are working on all the different projects that I mentioned briefly. Uh, we're working on bioelectronic medicine applications uh, uh, of machine learning. So, we, you know, how we can use machine learning algorithms to decode nerve signals that we record from these peripheral nerves. Uh, we are also using similar approaches to uh, decode or analyze data that are acquired non-invasively from, from patients uh, as they relate to autonomic nervous system function. And... Uh, we also have the uh, the machine learning in medicine thrust where we essentially build AI algorithms to uh, assist our clinicians and uh, our nurses uh, to uh, to do their work more efficiently, better, uh, and, uh, and and help at the end of the day our patients. Um, so, in terms of where I see the world in ten years. I think one of the things that 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 seems to be, you know, in everyone's mind right now, and and I think it has a, a big promise in the next ten years, is the use of uh, AI and specifically these large language models and the technologies behind them, which are the transformers and 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 these specific models, um, that would uh, be able to really help us out in everyday life. So I, you know, I think there is in ten years. Every pretty much every one, every one of us will have some AI assistant that will make our lives a lot easier. In the same way that you know, before the iPhone smartphones, we couldn't necessarily imagine all the different things that we could be doing, uh, you know, at any given point in time during the day using these devices. I think the advent of these AI assistants will create a lot more possibilities for for every single human to just make their lives easier, whether that's there's a doctor that will use an AI assistant to help him with the everyday stuff of, of what he needs to do, whether it's an engineer that will have an AI assistant helping him to write better and faster code, whether it's a, a designer that uses these AI technologies to very quickly come up with like basic drawings that he can fine tune and make them better and make them his own. Uh, to all kinds of different applications that, you know, I, I can't think of all of them, of course. Uh, but I think that's where we're heading, where, uh, you know, these AI assistants will become a pretty much a standard thing for most people in the world. And it will save us a lot of time and it will enable us to be a bit, a lot more creative and will ena enable us to be a lot more efficient. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's kind of like one of the predictions that, it seems to me very plausible right now uh, based on how I see this technology uh, moving ahead. Uh, and in terms of electronic medicine, um, things in medical devices tend to move a lot slower than, than other technologies for a good reason. I mean, these devices are implanted in, uh, or interact with patients. So we've got to make sure that they are working, they're working properly and they don't create any problems, right? So in 10 years, I think we will def we will, I hope we have the next generation of these devices that are going to be smarter, that are going to be reacting rather than just imposing uh, their stimulation uh, and that uh, are going to be proven to be uh, efficacious so that we have more tools to fight all these different conditions and diseases that uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know, a lot of people have to face. Right, Doctor, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. I think we're living in a fantastic point of time. You mentioned that it's very difficult for us uh, normal lay people to imagine how this uh, acceleration of technology is going to help 
all different uh, in industry sectors but i think in the next few years like you rightfully pointed out ai assistants digital twins precision medicine is going to create a world where we will not just heal live longer but also healthier so in that note really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button and until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you really appreciate this thank you thank you for having me and i really enjoyed it as well thanks